Coming up, with the world's coral reefs in crisis, can scientists speed up Mother Nature by a factor of 50? We think that in one year, it will grow a coral which would have taken 25 to 50 years in the wild. And researchers in Missouri lend a helping hand to an endangered salamander. And it's not just about a funny looking creature. We depend on water just as much as these animals do, so if there are problems that are inherent in the water, it's gonna impact us eventually too. Exploring the frontiers of science. Probing cutting edge technologies. Seeking answers to the big questions. Welcome to SciTech Central. Coral reefs are complex structures that draw thousands of exotic sea creatures and legions of human admirers. They're also crucial to a healthy planet Earth. But with corals dying off in many of the Earth's waters, scientists are in a race against time to restore these irreplaceable marine features. About half a mile off the Florida Keys, a small group of scientists confronts an underwater crisis. Coral reefs here and around the world have been dying at an alarming rate. Dave Vaughn leads the team at the Moat Tropical Research Lab in Summerlin Key, about 20 miles from Key West. He says the future of the world's coral reefs is vital to the overall health of the oceans. Even though they're less than 1% of the ocean surface, they're responsible for 25 to 40% of the world's fisheries. So if we lose our corals, we really will have a big impact on everything in the ocean. This is America's only living barrier coral reef here in the Florida Keys. And it is in a, in a, in a perilous state at this point in time. The coral reefs provide the structure, the home, and the food for all the reef fish that are important, both commercially and recreationally. They also provide the place where so many thousands, hundreds of thousands of visitors go every year to spend time recreating. And they really want to see healthy reefs, they want to see a lot of fish, and they want clear water. All of these things are important to divers and to the people that enjoy our areas. Restoring those reefs are to, will keep them sustainable for the future. Billy Causey says a quarter of the world's corals have died in recent decades because of pollution, overfishing, and climate change. There's a global crisis right now occurring with coral reefs and their decline. We are already in a, in a condition here with our reefs that makes them extremely vulnerable. So everything that we can do as managers and scientists to not only understand our reefs, but to protect them for the long term, to make them more sustainable for the future, helps us. In an effort to reverse the decline, these biologists are attempting life-saving transplants for Florida's coral reefs by grafting new corals onto them. Well, these tanks are growing corals, uh, which are part animal, part plant, part mineral. They're basically a little understood organism. Other biologists have tried transplanting new corals to dead reefs, but the Moat Team's experiment is considered groundbreaking. That's because the coral species they're growing is critical to the reef structure. And until recently, it took centuries to grow. Most of these corals, the size of uh, a good boulder, the size of a car, would be 500 to 1,000 years old. But now since we've lost 25 to 40 percent of the world's corals, we can't wait 100 years or a couple hundred years just to get one more of each back here. We need to try and help Mother Nature out. Vaughn and his team aren't waiting. They discover that when cut into small strips, the slow-growing living corals quickly try to heal themselves. The technique is called microfragmenting. By cutting it, you're actually stimulating it to grow. Now, these reef-building corals will grow much faster than normal. We put them all in a, in a circle about the size of a dinner plate. And we think that in one year, it will grow a coral which would have taken 25 to 50 years in the wild. What he's getting with this microfragmentation is growth spurts, unlike anything we've ever seen. Once they successfully grow the corals in the nursery, the team searches for a transplant match, dead corals of the same species. A big coral boulder is essentially just a rock. It's, it's uh, the material that the living tissues have deposited over dozens or hundred years. But the only thing that's alive is that little veneer of tissue on the outside, which is essentially what we're bringing back. Before the actual transplant, the corals are placed in a cage for 30 days to protect them from predators. When the corals lose some of their color, becoming less attractive to predators, 
the researchers punch holes in the dead structures and attach the new corals. The hope is the two will eventually fuse together. Rudiger Bieler is documenting the marine life around this reef. To see what lives in that area before we do the restoration, what happens during the restoration, and what kind of species are coming in afterwards. But the question remains, will these new corals, subject to the same ocean stressors as their predecessors, survive in the wild? To find out, the team is recreating current ocean conditions. They adjust acidity levels in the nursery tanks to see which corals tolerate the simulated conditions. Billy Causey says the work being done here is buying time for the world's coral reefs, but a real solution to the crisis requires a much larger response. It's giving us time for our reefs to hang on as long as they can just by having stock that we can eventually put back out there. Now, will this repair the reefs like we repaired Humpty Dumpty? Well, you know the story of Humpty Dumpty, and I'm not sure we can put it all back together again. And I don't think we can rely on coral aquaculture as the, as the single solution for coral reef decline. We still have to fix land-based sources of pollution, habitat loss and destruction, and overfishing. And we're working on all of those. But it's going to take our global leaders to address climate change. And we have to have the time for those actions to take place. Mercedes Strovsky is a cake artist who loves nature. Her six-foot sculpture of an imaginary Florida reef is made entirely of cake and icing. I was chosen to make the cake show at the ice convention that was at Disney World. I said, okay, I'm going to do something different. You know, I'm going to do things about Florida. I chose to donate it to the Orlando Science Center. I think this is a great place to be displayed because all the kids, you know, they can see it and they can learn about the corals, about the ocean, the Everglades, a little bit of everything about nature, but very, very Floridian. The Museum of Natural History in New York houses what may be the most elaborate coral reef diorama in the world. The story of how this installation was created is almost as beguiling as the Caribbean reef it celebrates. Coral's been around since the Cambrian. More than 540 million years ago, coral evolved. There are some corals, some of the black corals, these deep water black corals you get that just seem to live forever. So you can have a single organism that's grown for four or 5,000 years. It's amazing. My name is John Sparks, and I'm a curator of ichthyology at the American Museum of Natural History. First of all, that diorama is, is very unusual in the sense that it's a two-level two diorama, which I think is kind of magical. So on the upper level in the Hall of Ocean Life, you'll see a view of Andros Island as if you were on a ship. You can see the ocean out to your left, and you can see these big breakers breaking as they hit a coral reef. And then you get this wonderful lagoon, and you look across that lagoon to Andros Island. But that kind of masks this extraordinary cacophony of life that was taking place underneath the water surface. My name is Melanie Stiasny, and I'm curator of fishes here at the American Museum. When that diorama was built, the research was done for it in the 1920s, and then it was installed in the 30s. At that time, we were incredibly a terrestrial species. I mean, pe people really didn't know anything about coral reefs. It was almost like images from the Mars rover. I mean, this was a place that no one knew about. They, 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 they just couldn't even imagine what it was like. It must have been an extraordinary endeavor to actually carry out the field work that was necessary to recreate this scene under the water in Andros Reef. It would have involved tremendous logistics. I mean, steamboat transportation, all of the scientific equipment. I mean, I think it was 40 tons of coral, which was actually brought from Andros to New York City to construct that coral reef. This was before scuba. 
So the only way they could really get down and draw it was to actually get down and draw it. And they had to have waterproof paint. And these guys, these artists, were going down there with their paintbrush and actually making these paintings underwater. That was phenomenal. I mean, that was like going to the moon or something. Corals and jellyfishes and sea anemones, they all fall in the same major group, Cnidaria. They all have a similar body plan in a way, these, these radially symmetrical, which means kind of circular tentacles coming out. It's an animal and they're multicellular and frequently they live in colonies and they can be either hard corals, which secrete a calcium carbonate skeleton. And you see these big brain corals, things like that, they all rely on the skeleton to grow and raise themselves up higher to you know, get more sunlight, get more food, basically. Or soft corals, as you'll see in many places. If you're diving on a reef, a lot of times, especially at night, you'll see the coral polyps extended out into the water and they're filter feeding. But if you think about the water off of New York or New Jersey, it's very cloudy. There's a lot more productivity here. It's a lot richer water. We don't have these, these tropical coral reefs here. When you go down to the Caribbean, the Bahamas, the water is very clear. There's not a lot of nutrients, not a lot of resources. So they rely on the, on the dinoflagellates then that live within their tissues to produce the food for them. So via sunlight, they're able to generate food. And if you think about, you know, that, that allows them to live in these very unproductive waters. The coral benefits and the dinoflagellate benefits. So it's a symbiosis. Many corals, you'll have a male coral and female coral. Um, others will be hermaphrodite. They're both male and female. But regardless, they produce eggs and sperm. Do you see these mass spawning of corals at certain times with certain triggers? And the triggers can be phases of the moon, temperature, often very subtle cues, but what happens is they all spawn at the same time. It makes perfect sense to be synchronized because you're just squirting eggs into the water and sperm into the water, and you want to make sure you do it at the same time so that the sperm and the eggs contact each other and fertilize the egg to produce a, a larvae. And it looks like a scum, it looks like a sludge, it looks like pollution, it's not pollution, it's fertilized coral eggs. And it floats on the water surface and then the fertilized eggs hatch into larvae and then these larvae are carried off in the ocean currents. And in time, they will develop and settle out of the water column, land very often on another coral reef or maybe their own coral reef, depending on how the, the water currents are. Every time I go to the Andros Reef, I, I see different things. I mean, depending on what, I'm, what I've been reading about, what I'm working on, what interests me at the time, you look, you stand, and you'll always see something different. Want to satisfy your scientific curiosity and be on TV at the same time? Send us a video question for our Ask a Scientist feature. Here's an example. My name is Kelly. I'm from Orlando, Florida. Um, I know coral reefs are important to the health of the oceans, but I would like to know why. Go to our Facebook page to learn how to submit your video. Across the country, communities are developing strategies to cope with climate change. Reporter Rick Carr examines how one New York community is harnessing an unusual creature to protect its shoreline. Just before 7 a.m. on a summer morning is pretty much the perfect time to get out into the water and gather some oysters. If there's any oysters, they kind of occur in these groups. We call them clumps. These oysters are not for dinner. They came from the mouth of the Bronx River, where it flows into the East River. They're for science. Allison Fitzgerald from the environmental group New York, New Jersey Baykeeper says she and other marine biologists have been interested in these oysters for about a decade. Back in 2004, the Parks Department started to notice, as you see here on the tires and stuff, all these natural oysters here. We didn't put any of these here, they just happened to be here. Even with all the pollutants in the water and all of the sewage overflows that go into the water when there's a big rainstorm, right in the shadow of LaGuardia Airport and Hunts Point Market, the scientists wanted to find out how they're surviving here 
to see whether it was possible to get more of them to survive. Fitzgerald and a group of volunteers came out to check the artificial oyster beds environmental groups set up last year and find out how many of the baby oysters that had been planted had survived and reproduced. The theory is that if an oyster bed can make it here at the mouth of the Bronx River, it can make it anywhere. And the waters around New York could use more oysters. Oysters are able to filter the water, so if there's any particulates in it, they will remove that. They're also able to harbor pollutants. Oysters also clump together when a bed thrives, and Fitzgerald says that's the key to restoring the marine environment. So they build up this like 3D reef, like a coral reef, and then the fishies swim through, and the worms, and the crabs, and everybody creates this whole healthy ecosystem that if the oyster reef wasn't here, it would just be a vast mud flat, which a lot of things can't grow on. This is one of several projects aimed at bringing more oysters to the metro area. But even the most ambitious one, which hopes to plant a billion of them in and around New York Bay, won't come close to restoring how many used to be here. New York was thought to be the oyster capital of the world. There were 350 square miles of oyster reefs, and um, up to 6 billion, maybe even 9 billion oysters were in the harbor. Emily Driscoll is a documentarian whose film Shell Shocked looks at efforts to bring oysters back to New York. She says a thriving population of oysters could help New York's shoreline. We saw what happened during Hurricane Sandy. We're susceptible to floodings. Oyster reefs can diminish some of that wave energy. Is that a horseshoe crab? Yeah. The volunteers in the Bronx included a couple of architects from SCAPE, the firm that's planning an artificial oyster reef along the shore of Staten Island. Allison Fitzgerald of New York, New Jersey Baykeeper says the project at the mouth of the Bronx River gives volunteers an opportunity to feel connected to the water that surrounds most of the city. I love the idea of having all these college students and volunteers come out here and showing them why I'm so excited to be here. This is like get in the water, get the waders on, see what the actual reef looks like, work alongside the actual scientists and get out here and do some good work. Fitzgerald says we'll never be able to fully restore the waters around New York to the way they were when there were billions of oysters in them. But it'll be a step in the right direction if more New Yorkers come down to the water for a perspective on how the urban environment fits into the natural one. You're right by Hunts Point. You're right by LaGuardia. You're right by Rikers Island. You're in the South Bronx. And it's beautiful. There's egrets on the shore. There's crabs out there, there's oysters, there's mud. It's a great place to be. The hellbender, the largest aquatic salamander in the country, has been on the endangered species list since 2011. But like many animals, it doesn't like to reproduce in captivity. Reporter Jim Kircher explores how researchers at the St. Louis Zoo are trying to save this little known but important creature. What we came to see at the St. Louis Zoo is not on display. It's actually behind the herpetarium where they keep the snakes and other assorted reptiles and amphibians. And if you come back here on the right day, you might get to meet Irene. Not the woman in the wetsuit, that's Shauna. Irene is the big salamander she has just fished out of its nest. One of our female hellbenders. How old? Uh, we don't know her age because she was a wild collected adult. She could be anywhere from, you know, 10 to 35, who knows. She is one of the hellbenders living and more importantly and amazingly reproducing in what is no mere trough. This is about your typical size of an adult. These are miniature streams with flowing water, the speed of the current, the temperature, the minerals, all carefully controlled to match the hellbender's native habitat, the spring-fed waterways of the Ozarks. There were once maybe 10,000 or more of these guys in Missouri and northern Arkansas, but over time, for some or many reasons, they declined into the hundreds. At the same time, the survivors showed a high rate of severe injuries that hadn't healed properly, which could be due to a combination of many factors. Um, you'll notice that she's missing a, a right foot and a back right leg. About 70 to 80 percent of the animals that we find on the Ozark rivers have got some sort of anomaly. A big part of this is simply preserving the species, biodiversity, the balance in the Ozark River ecosystem. But there's more to it than that. 
Hellbenders may not be as majestic or cuddly as some other endangered animals. After all, one of their nicknames is snot otter. But freshwater species are disappearing just as fast or faster, and amphibians are at the greatest risk. The hellbender has lungs, but underwater, it absorbs oxygen along those rippling folds of skin. And whatever is in the water, it absorbs that too. Think canary in the coal mine. We depend on water just as much as these animals do, so if there are problems that are inherent in the water that are impacting hellbenders and other forms of wildlife, it's going to impact us eventually too. So the St. Louis Zoo, the Missouri Department of Conservation, and other partners set out not just to study the hellbender, but to figure out how to breed them in captivity, raise the offspring, and put them back into the streams. Now catching a hellbender is actually pretty easy. During the day, you find them lolling about in their nests under rocks. But getting them to reproduce in captivity, that would take 10 years. There were so many things to get right, so many things that could and did go wrong. The zoo started with an indoor stream. The males and females were doing their jobs, but the eggs just weren't getting fertilized. Every year, the zookeepers would adjust this or that, but still, no babies. So a few years ago, they tried something else. They thought maybe an outside environment would help, and they built the outdoor streams. Roomier, lidded nesting boxes, half buried, comfortably spaced, mimicking the rock nests of the territorial hellbender but still no success. So they went back to the water itself, looking at the ion and mineral concentrations, made a minor adjustment, and then waited to see if it would make a difference. It was, I remember the date, it was October 18th, 2011. We opened up one of the nest boxes out back and there was all these fertile eggs. They didn't just hatch 63 baby hellbenders, they made history. It was the first time anybody had bred them in captivity. Now, every fall, the keepers, all certified divers, reach in the nest and remove a long string of eggs, which are then placed in these trays. And we also shake the eggs, or rock the eggs, three times a day physically. And that's to take account what the male is doing in the bottom of the river. These are our newest babies. There are now thousands of hellbenders in these tanks. Two subspecies from two different Ozark River systems are bred separately and will be placed back into the streams where their parents were caught. And there they will feast on, among other things, crayfish. But they generally don't bother people. They're not poisonous, not aggressive. We're actually more interested in them than they are in us. So for us, being able to help uh, conserve a species that's right in our backyard, because you know, less than two hours from here, you can, you can be in the habitat of these guys. You don't have to go to Madagascar for this, do you? don't have to go to Madagascar, <laughs> you know? And we've been able to make a big impact right here at home. The Hellbender Project in Missouri is a success so far, but only up to a point. The population is being increased, but what about the factors that caused them to decline so dramatically in the first place? Was it disease, climate change, pollution, people collecting them for pets? Were their nests being filled up with silt because of changing riverbank vegetation? The zoo-raised hellbenders are being put back at various ages to see at what point in their development they are most vulnerable. And that means tracking, counting, measuring, at least for the next 15 years. We need to be paying attention to what's going on in these wild situations, just because eventually it's going to work its way up the chain to us. That's all for now on SciTech Central. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for more stories from the frontiers of science and technology.